Well, I first of all want to say that fear not. It's not just a, oh, don't be scared. No, no, no. Jesus, quite a bit when he was on earth, he said, don't fear. You know, you have little faith. Why did you fear? Fear steals from you. Fear torments you. Fear causes you to be in bondage. Like that song that we sing, it says, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. And God doesn't want you to have anything to do with fear. So what I want to encourage you today is when you're faced with either a bad report or a conflict that arises, maybe in the workplace or in the home, I want your first response not to be fear, but I want you to shut that fear down the minute that it comes up, that you will not give it the first word in the situation. Instead, you immediately go to God and stand on his word and silence the fear with his word. You can't just say, oh, I'm not going to fear, I'm not going to fear. Because the voice will get louder and it'll just overcome you. But if you say, no, I'm not going to fear, and then boom, here comes the word of God. That will stop the fear before it even gets started. And that's what God wants. <laughs> and here he says, fear not, for I am with you. Now, uh, Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2 says, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. And this is what should be our practice every day, but especially when we receive bad news or conflict. Our immediate response should be, look up, give it to God. Don't fear, don't let the enemy have a second of your time or your thought life. Look up, give it to God, and then look inward to see what God is saying to you because the Holy Spirit lives in you. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit, and He's got that power inside of you. He can guide you. He can teach you. He can bring wisdom. He can bring that peace. And so not only to look inside for the voice of the Spirit, but for that reservoir of the Word of God that you need to be putting in there on a daily basis way before the negative phone call comes. So be putting in the Word of God so when something happens, you can look up and then you can look in. It says in um, Psalms 145, verse 19, God grants the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cry for help and rescues them. So right there, anytime something bad happens, He's there to rescue you. It's a promise in His Word. Now I want us to... Uh, Want us to shake our arms and do a little exercise. Let's pretend you're getting a bad phone call right now, okay? Are you going to let fear say, uh-oh, now look what's going to happen to your finances. Look what's going to happen to your health. Look what happened to so-and-so. No, cut that off. Look up and look in. So let's try it, okay? Here comes the phone call. Look up and look in. Very good. Look up and look in. I want you to remember that. Because that will cut off the fear and it'll help you head in the right direction. Okay, um, it says don't uh, let the fear even start. You need to cut it off with the Word of God. So seek God's will. Now, this is important because we know God's will according to the Word. But in each of our situation, it may be different. What has happened for a relative uh, of yours may not happen in your case. So what you need to do when you get a bad uh, report, is seek God and say, God, okay, this is what I would like to happen. Like in the case of Sawyer, we prayed for Sawyer's eyes to be healed, that he would not have to go through surgery. Well, that was not wrong of us to do because we prayed in faith and we know God heals. Now, if we do not receive the answer that we're looking for, if for some reason God's plan is for us to walk through things that we really hadn't thought about, we don't give up on God. We don't get angry. We don't feel condemned for even asking. No, God loves it when we ask. He loves it when we walk in faith. He'd rather us walk in faith than be in fear and never ask at all. You know, he, we are to live by faith. Even Jesus in the Garden of, uh, of Gethsemane before the cross, he prayed. He said, Oh, Father, and this is in uh, Matthew 26, 39. Oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. Now notice, he had faith to receive what he was asking for, but he did it in humility, yielding to the Father, saying, you know, I would really like to not to have to go through this, but if for some reason your plan makes it to where I do have to go through this, then I, I yield to you, and I trust you. His heart was loyal to the Father, and that's how we need to be. We don't need to walk around in fear. We bring to God the request that we think is along His will. But if for some reason that doesn't get answered, we don't give up on God. We don't get bitter. We don't get fearful. We stay in that place of humility and say, you know what? I don't know why I have to go through this, but I know you're with me. And I'm going to stay loyal to you. In fact, Second Chronicles Chapter 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. So that's that part of being loyal to God no matter what happens, okay? Now, the second part of that line, do not fear, is I'm with you. Well, think about it. If you sent, let's say your neighbor came over and, and said, where's little Jimmy? Oh, I sent little Jimmy to the store. But Jimmy's only four years old. Uh, you send by himself? It's like, no, 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 his father's with him. Okay, see how that totally changed the situation? Our Heavenly Father with us takes care of everything. Things that we don't know are coming, things that we have no idea how to deal with. When he says, I'm with you, that should take care of everything. Uh, look at him. Um, but it's really exciting. Um, in Psalms 23, everybody's heard this verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Him being with you should just dispel the fear. Now, there's other things that happen when he's with you, as in Genesis 39, verses 2 and 3. It says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he do prosper. Well, that's a pretty neat, you know, byproduct of having God with you is to be successful in what he's called you to do. He wanted Joseph to be a bright light. In fact, eventually the whole uh, Egyptian area was going to be under his command. And he probably could have gotten a good report uh, from this Egyptian master to say, yeah, he can handle it. I've seen what he can do. So God had a purpose for doing that. Now for Joshua, in Joshua 1, verses 5 and 9, it says, no man shall stand, be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. And in verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So that's the reason we can get rid of all fear. He is with you. Now the second line in Isaiah 41.10 says, Be not dismayed, I'm your God. To me, dismayed is more along the lines of uh, deeper than fear, that, that area where you've slipped into depression or you've slipped into grief, excessive grief, <clears throat> or you've maybe um, given up, you know, you've been disheartened. Well, God doesn't want you to go there. Not only is fear bad, but this torment and mental anguish is the root cause of many physical diseases. And many mental disorders as well. And of course God does not want that for you. God doesn't want cancer, heart disease, any of this. And these are the root causes of that. So again, don't go there. Don't allow you know, your mind to meditate on scenarios. Stop those scenarios and go to the word of God. Keep that gaze upward. Because he wants you to be a strong and courageous people. He doesn't want you hurting. He doesn't want you defeated. And this is the way he does it. Uh, not only because he's with you, but through his word. That you're fighting that with his very word. Now in John 14, 27. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled. That would be the dismayed part. Neither let it be afraid. Now notice Jesus gave us another weapon against the fear, and that's his peace. 
I want you to see something in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, be anxious for nothing. Don't even let fear start. <clears throat> but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Look up and give it to Him. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Did you know you have access to a guard over your heart and your mind? It's the very peace of God. In fact, it's so powerful. People will look at you and, and your situation and go, wow, how in the world can you have peace right now? It's such a powerful peace. It's un as you can't understand how you would have it, but it's there. And it's real. And it's from Jesus. Not as the world gives, but it's from Jesus. And it's very powerful. It's a force that guards your heart and your mind. So that's an amazing verse to stand on there. Um, 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, Humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. He cares. He loves you guys so much. Yeah, like like the pastor said, you have no idea the depth of his, his love is so much even farther than a mother's love, which is pretty incredible. But he loves you and he cares for you, so cast every care on him. Now this part here, uh, I want to spend a little time on it. Um, I am your God. It's really cool to think about that. Um, I'm sure some of the teenagers, when they think of a God, their idea might be an avenger with all the powers, or maybe a Jedi that uses the Force, or maybe a genie that can, you know, grant every request. But that is not our God. Those are Hollywood special effects and fantasies. Our God can be found in this book right here. This is a real book about real people, real events, and the one true real God. So if you want to know about your God, this is where you find it. Okay? Um, Isaiah 43, let's see, verse 13. God himself was speaking. He said, from eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch anyone out of my hands. No one can undo what I have done. He's an amazing, powerful God. And there's nobody like him. I mean, he's so pure and so good. It seemed like all other uh, beings in the universe always have some hidden agenda, some, uh, you know, twisted motive. But our God is a good God, and there's nobody like him. He is altogether faithful. Um, so when he announces himself as God, as he did to Abraham in Genesis 17, uh, he said, I'm a God and make covenant with you. I will always be your God and oh, the God of your descendants. And when he announced himself to Moses in Exodus 3, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. <clears throat> the reason I mention that is when he said who he's God of, he always works through a human being. He loves people, and for him to get glory to his name, people have to look at your life and say, I'm the God of Daniel, I'm the God of David, I'm the God of... And, and he's, you look at their lives and you're like, wow, he's an amazing God. And that's what he wants to do for you. He wants you to let him be your God. And then when people in the community see the things going on in your life and how God turns things, because the enemy means things for evil, but God turns them to good. And they see that and they're like, I want to know your God. And so it's very important for us to see him as a God, the one true God, and to know that that's another reason why we should be dismayed. He's our God. There's nothing he can't do. Um, let's see. We know what he did for Daniel. And I'm going to, I really was looking forward to doing this. I hope I have time, so we're going to rush through. But I'm going to take you on a journey of imagination right now. We're going to have fun. We know what happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so what I want you to do is I want you to put on your imagination and walk with me as I try to understand what it might have been like for Meshach on that day, okay? So here we go. <clears throat> wow, you guys, 
we made that stand for God, and we really made the king mad. I have never seen the king as mad as he is right now. He is heating that furnace up. Oh, man, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know. I know my God's going to deliver me. I know I'm, we're going to make it through this. Uh, and if we don't, he's worth dying for anyway. And so, you know what? I, I, I'm watching for a geyser. I bet God's going to shoot a geyser up and put the fire out. So we don't even have to go in there. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. And if not that, maybe he's going to send an earthquake and crack the earth open and swallow that furnace. And so I know he's got something up his sleeve. I can't wait to see. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, no. Here comes those warrior guys. They're they're binding us up to throw us in. Well, that's not fun. Now we have to go in all down. Well, you know, I'm just watching. It's going to happen. Oh, no. That warrior guy just died. The one that's thrown us in. And now we're in the furnace. Oh, God. Where was... Where was the earthquake? Where was the geyser? You're worth dying for. And I, I love that. But, but man, fire is the worst way to die. Oh, God. Now, wait. Shouldn't I be in intense pain right now? Wait a minute. Shouldn't our clothes be being burned? Oh, my hair. My, my hair is still here. Oh, wow. God. Oh, my gosh. You're there with us. Wow. I never even thought of this kind of rescue. Man, this is over the top. This is just like, ooh, look at the flame. <laughs> I can feel it, but it doesn't hurt. This is so cool. <gasps> this is what you did with that bush. And to get Moses' attention, you got to show me how you do this, God. Wow, man, look at this. Wow, it's loud in here. What do you say? The king? What do you say? The king's freaking out. Oh, my God. He can see you in here with us. This is amazing. Oh, man. This is like, ooh. wow. Okay, well, oh, you have to go to this little Well, Thank you, thank you, thank you for saving us. I really thank you for that. Wow, you guys. Wow, what a bit ago? Oh, the king wants us to come out there? No, 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 wait. Wait, wait, guys. Make the king come in here. <laughs> Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. I shouldn't be cocky. I repent, Father. It's only by your grace and your divine protection that we're not post right now. So, come on, guys. Let's go show the goodness of our God. Amen. Amen. So that was my part of this. You know, the reason I, I, I draw attention to that is because... When they came out, the king that had been so angry and so ready to annihilate them, it says uh, in uh, Daniel chapter 3 and verse 28, Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any other god except their own. Notice, their trial of faith, or their testing of faith, affected so much more than just them. Your trial that you're going through, God may have designed it to touch so many more people than just you. You know, you're watched by your kids, you're watched by your family members, you're watched by your co-workers, and the people in the community that know you and have heard you say, oh, I gave it over to God. They're watching. And when God turns it around for you, think of the effect that it has so much farther than you. The other thing I wanted to call to attention was the fact that God didn't rescue them the way they were expecting. He didn't send the earthquake. He did a lot better job than what they had in mind. So know that God, if you're asking him for a certain thing, that's fine. But he may have planned something way cooler than what you're asking for so just watch for them and know it's not too late that they, Daniel and Shadrach, and Shadrach, they, all of them, got the death sentence. They weren't spared from that. And they were in the middle of their execution when they got rescued. So it wasn't like a point of no return for God. God was like, bring it on, you know, because he, he had a plan all along and they didn't stop it, uh, even though they had to go through what they did. So keep your faith strong, keep your eyes on God, 
and know that he's your God and he wants to be your God. He's got so many amazing powers that's up there. Just let me be God. Let me be God. I want to do something cool for you. So have faith in him. <laughs> know that he's doing it because he loves you. He loves you so much. He wants to show himself strong on your behalf and to reward you for your faith for that. Now, the next line in the verse said, um, I will strengthen you. Now, to me, this is so amazing because God is a powerful God. He's building a strong, amazing kingdom. And he's not the type of God that's going to say, you know, I have, don't have time for the week. They slow me down. No. God designed you, and he knows exactly what it means to strengthen you. He knows the areas where you're weak. He knows that his spirit has more than enough power to strengthen you. So let's look at some verses that speak about that. Paul said in Ephesians 3, uh, he was uh, in verses 14 through 16, he was praying a prayer over the people. Now in verse 16, he said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That's why we look in, because his spirit is in there and he strengthens you with his might inside you. And so you can draw from his strength when your strength runs out. Okay, Psalms 29, 11 says the Lord gives strength to his people. He blesses his people with peace. Um, now this one, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, I've read this in the Passion Translation. I don't know if you're familiar with the Passion Translation, but it is beautiful. And it's, it, it clarifies things um, for me sometimes. But this is what that same verse said in the Passion Translation. I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. That's pretty cool. When you're faced with something that you're like, okay, this is going to be really difficult, you can go to that first and say, I have access to Christ's explosive power that it Jesus me to handle this. And that's it's such a, a wonderful thing to stand on. Uh, when Paul, uh, in 2 Timothy 4, there were many times when Paul was in uh, court because he was accused of causing such disruption. That a lot of times the people he was staying with or the people that were ministering with him would stand and be in court with him. Well, in this particular instance, in 2 Timothy 4, verses 16 and 17, they actually deserted him. He said, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Now look at verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. So that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. God is so amazing. If he's asking you to do a certain assignment, to reach a certain uh, sphere of influence, he's going to stand with you and strengthen you to make sure that you do it. Uh, he's not going to abandon you or like, well, you're on your own. No, he's there to strengthen you and to help you and stand with you, which I thought was amazing. Uh, Colossians 1, verse uh, 11, Paul again is praying for the church, and he said that you be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering. Well, here's another reason we need strength. Actually, in verse uh, 10, right before that, he was praying that they walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Well, if you're going to walk worthy of the Lord, you're walking in humility. You're walking in love with people that are coming against you. Well, that takes patience. That takes endurance. And so you can pray for the strength of patience and endurance. With family members that are difficult, with uh, bosses that, you know, overlook you or neglect you, you can pray and receive not only strength and stamina to get your job done, but to be patient and to endure so that you can walk away worthy of the Lord and fully pleasing to Him. Now, uh, the next part says, yes, I will help you. Well, we all know Psalms 121, verse 1 and 2. Well, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's, that's a 
solid rock. You know, that's my health it's definitely comes from that. In fact, uh, it says yeah. in Psalm uh, 146 verses 3 through 5, I do not mind. put your trust in princes or in government, you know, people, nor in the Son of Man, in whom she there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth, and that very day his plans perish. You have no idea when God's going to take you home. You have no idea when your life on earth is going to end. So if you're depending upon a human being to be your help, it may be that, okay, they've got their own issue that just popped up, you know? Um, it says in verse 5, Happy is he who has the Lord God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. God is so awesome, and he is your solid source of help. So whenever you need help, I think of these people that go through all these things, and then they're like, well, we did everything we can. All, all we can do is pray. It's like, oh, my goodness. God should be your first, first run to, your first source of help that you need to counsel from, that you look at. Boom, first, pray. You know, not the last resort. Um, Hebrews 4, 16 <laughs> It says, let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we have may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is really important to me. Um, I look back at so many seasons in my life where I was asked to do things that's like, oh, wow, are you sure I could do that, God? I'm not sure. His grace was there for me for that. Um, to write a book. What if God asked you to write a book? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Crack that up. No, that's, that's a lot of work. And, you know, and, but if he asks you to do it, he's going to give you the grace to get it done. Uh, I used a lot of the costumes I used to make for my older son. He used to love Bible Man. And I'm amazed at how I got that done on top of teaching a Bible study, on top of, you know, homeschooling, all this stuff. And I look back and I'm like, how in the world did I do that? How did it turn out so well? It was his grace. But you know, when that season or that task is over, sometimes that grace is lifted. I could not go back and do everything I used to do. But it says it's his grace. And when you need that grace to do something that God's asked you to do that's way beyond your resources, way beyond your wisdom, way beyond your capabilities, his grace will empower you. So you can turn around then and say, look, that had to be God, you know, and it was God. It's Him giving you grace. And so uh, I just wanted to let you know if you are facing something that you're concerned about, just ask for His grace. And uh, I'm going to go to the last point now. Uh, I will hold you with my right hand. So if the worship team could go ahead and Okay. Um, he says, I will hold you with my right hand. Right hand. This is in times where you have become so overladen, you know, with so many stuff. You're burdened down. You're just, the load is so heavy. You don't even feel like you can walk across the room anymore. God will uphold you with his righteous right hand. Like that, uh, that poem of the footprints in the sand, the guy dreamed that there were two sets of footprints, but when life got hard, there was only one set. And that's when God was carrying him. And that's the idea here. He's carrying you. In fact, Psalms 145, verse 14, says, The Lord helps the fallen. He lifts those that are bent beneath their load. That's what kind of God he is. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come to me, you who are labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He sees the burden. He sees. But, it, but look, he says, come to me. There again. Go straight up. Go straight up. Don't wallow in it. Go straight up so that it doesn't have a chance to cause any deeper issues within you. He says, come to me. I will give you rest. He knows exactly what's going to cause the load to be lightened. And he is the one person who can do it. Now, uh, Psalms thirty-four, eighteen says, the Lord is close to the broken hearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. When your heart is broken, when you've suffered like a, a deep rejection, maybe even through a divorce or something, or when you're dealing with excessive grief and you feel your spirit is just crushed, he's there to rescue you. 
He knows what it's going to take. He knows the strength and the peace that you need um, as you're walking through this. He's there with you. He loves you. He can lift you. He can strengthen you. And remember, his peace goes beyond understanding. Okay, so know that these are things that you can count on. Um, but remember, and every time you bring a request to him, always do it in the humility of, even if this doesn't happen the way I'm thinking it should, I accept and I stay loyal to you. And he'll show himself strong on your behalf. There's one more scripture that I'm going to leave you with, and I want you to just devour it and, and rest your heart on it. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. I know that it's hard sometimes when you can't see God to run there first, but he has to be your hope. If you got a call that says, you know, oh, sorry, you've been let go of your job. Well, most of you would panic and fear. No. You know what? God's my source. He gave me that job. He can give me another. My hope and my trust is in God because he's real. And in the next verse after that, it says, For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. It will not fear when he comes. Its leaf will stay green. It will not be anxious in the year of drought, and it will not cease from yielding fruit. That's the thing. If you give in to fear, if you give in to depression, then Satan's able to shut you down and you stop producing fruit for God. So know that he loves you. He's there to strengthen you, to help you, to uphold you. He's going to make sure you're safe. And despite some of the hard things that we have to go through, you can trust him. In the end, he will work it out, even if it's in heaven. You'll look back and see why you had to go through that. God and he loves you so much so be blessed and stand on these scriptures and shut that fear down okay all right God bless you amen